Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I think I'm having some issues with my connection. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Ila? Yes, I can hear you. And let's see if someone on YouTube is writing me. Everyone, it's okay. Everyone can hear. I don't see any feedback. I, I hope it works. Let's try. I see that my my image is kind of like freezing and yes. blocked sometimes. But so uh, I would like to. OK, sorry. Now, from the public, they say yes, they can hear us. OK, perfect. So welcome, everyone. Uh, we have a very special event today with other three three chapters from Lady UX that are joining us from five different time zones. So this event is very important for us. Uh, even though we are living in a terrible period of time right now, we found this as an opportunity of collaborating, collaborating among with other chapters simultaneously that I, I don't think it would ever happen um, in this moment. So we are very happy for this collaboration. Uh, please write on the comments where where you're based if you didn't write, uh, and don't forget to to like this video and subscribe to our channel. So this is a, a event that I said from Ladies That UX. We are Eli and I. We are Ladies That UX Milan, and Ladies That UX is a, a global community that started back in 2013 in Manchester. And we support women and people that identify themselves as women, working with UX, uh, letting them speak, promoting their skill and talent. So it's very important to mention that we're not a community against any gender, and we welcome everyone to, to our events. We are present in more than 75 cities. Uh, these are some of the cities that we, we have a chapter of Ladies at that UX. And Ladies at UX Milan is the first chapter in, in Italy. So we are very, very happy to be here. Uh, I'm Mariana Ozaki. First of all, uh, I would like to, to describe myself for accessibility. Uh, I'm Mariana Ozaki. I work as a, a service interaction designer. Um, I'm Asian. I'm using uh, some earphones and a, a black dress, like a turtleneck. And I have this beautiful background that everyone thinks is my, my place, but it's not like it's a fake background uh, with a filter. And I think that's it. Ila? Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. I'm Ilaria, Laria Farina. Uh, I'm a user experience designer. Uh, I'm Italian. I'm going to describe my, myself as well. Uh, I'm wearing glasses. Uh, otherwise, I can't hear. I can't see you. Um, I have um, black uh, black hair, and uh, I'm wearing a, a sort of a yellow dress uh, with no sleeves. And I'm here in Milan, in uh, in my house, in my living room. Actually, the real one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what else? These are some of our social media. If you are a lady that UX in Milan please uh, join us on Slack in our Slack group. And for the other social media, don't forget to, to follow us to receive more information about our events. Um, and if you want to contribute with our community, don't forget to send us a message. Uh, if you have any feedback, uh, please text us that we're going to be very happy to answer. Me or Ilaria will be answering you right away. So for today's agenda, uh, we will have the four talks starting from Taipei, then Milan, then Bangalore and Tokyo. And then we will start our panel um, when we, where we start with some questions prepared uh, for the speakers and then we will open to the public. If you have any, any questions during the presentation, please comment, uh, write on the comments. And then in the end of the event, we will select some of them to answer, okay? Um, each 
each talk will will last 15 15 minutes more or less and then we will have so we will have the four talks and then the panel uh please feel free to comment in any in any language that you feel more comfortable uh because our chapter leaders are are here and they they can translate it to to english if we the other speakers can can answer so okay i think we can start yes let me just um yes so go <laughs> go you Ila. No, I do one. Uh, our first guest uh, is a, a lady that UX uh, Taipei chapter, and we are we want to um, have a warm welcome to uh, these ladies, uh, which is Jane and Evelyn. Then we will introduce uh, the speech of uh, Shinje. Uh, I hope I pronounce it correctly. <laughs> so I pass the word to those uh, incredible ladies. Hope you enjoyed. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi, everyone. My name is Jane Shi, and we have Evelyn here. Uh, she's our core volunteer and upcoming director for the chapter. Um, Hi. Lady UX Taipei. Uh, oh, I'm actually based in Taipei, and today is our Dragon Ball Festival. So I have been eating a lot of rice balls today. Um, and I'm in my living room, uh, in my bedroom, uh, and then celebrating Dragon Ball uh, Festival. How about Elvin? Hi, I am a US designer work at a back trend exchange company. Yeah, so this year um, I have held many lady last year's Taipei events with Jen. So cool. enjoying today, everyone. Next slide, please. Mariana? Thank you. So Lady in UX Taipei was set up uh, in 2016 and we have monthly meetups like this. And we also host uh, actually the one, uh, the only one actually uh, Talk UX 2017 in Asia, is, which is a global conference that hosted uh, under Lady UX. Um, and you know, we were fortunate enough to invite our co-founder uh, and also uh, at the time, uh, also uh, Lizzie Dyson to Taipei and with a lot of uh, speakers. So next slide, please. Lizzie uh, was on the stage at the time, and then we have around 400 people um, in the big uh, venue. Next one, please. So uh, we have actually a lot of our volunteers helping, and now uh, our membership is around uh, 2,000 people. Um, so you can tell Evelyn uh, just introduced herself, and we have actually uh, a few directors um, in the past, and uh, I'm the currently active director with Evelyn. Next one, please. So join us, we have a Facebook page, which is pretty active. Uh, we post a lot of events and also uh, a lot of uh, UX related articles, events. Uh, so, you know, feel free to join us. Um, either follow us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. Um, for our speaker, Xinjie is actually a senior UX designer and she was born and raised in Taipei, uh, in Taiwan. And she actually is now in London. She's uh, based in London uh, and then has very uh, extensive experiences in SaaS product, uh, product design. She currently works for a digital agency called Equino. Uh, she is part of, uh, the, the company is part of the Harvest Group and she focuses on user research and RWD interaction design. So that's welcome, Qingjie. Thank you. Hello, hi everyone. Okay, so now you should be able to see my slides. Perfect. Um, thank you, Jen and Evelyn for um, introduce. And thank you for having me here, everyone. My topic today is localization A to Z from translations to deep understanding the needs. Um, I'm going to lightly touch on different localization approaches when you are trying to design for different cultures and countries. And before we start, um, I can tell you a little bit about myself. So as introduced, my name is Xinjie Ye. I am a senior UX designer at Aikino. I'm right now wearing my t-shirt, Greek t-shirts and wearing my glasses, sitting in my living room and enjoy the very rare hot weather in London. 
So yes, I'm based in London, but I am Asian and I grew up in Taipei, Taiwan. All my family's educations, um, cultural experience, and things that influenced me were from Taiwan. And actually, I never really thought I'll move to London until I decided to start it in Scotland six years ago. So what I did is I bring my previous knowledge and experience like a little bubbles with me and start to work in this very international city, London. It was amazing to meet people all over the world. We right now have six UX designers in the teams and from four different countries. Um, consider the whole organization, we have more than 2000 people in the same buildings, is even more diverse. However, um, it's quite, personally, it's quite challenging for me at the beginning. I am a foreigner and try to adapt to the British cultures when working with my colleagues. Plus right now, uh, French culture is a bit because it's a French company and it requires a lot of learnings and communication so I can understand my colleagues and at the same time they can understand my design, uh, design assumptions and expectations. It's also me. <laughs> Sometimes I will represent uh, British design teams and design for our clients uh, worldwide. And our target markets are in the UK, sometimes US, and some European countries like Germany, Switzerland, Spain, Italy, and another focusing market is the great Chinese market, which include China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, sometimes um, Singapore or Malaysia as well. So you can see that I kind of take that spot as my advantage and I can provide some knowledge there. But even when I speak the same language and the same reading systems, I can't say I am fully understand the Chinese or Singaporean cultures. Uh, but what I can do for our team is to provide my experience on learnings, different cultures, and try to bring our team closer to our users. Quite often, uh, if you are working for uh, overseas clients, it means you don't have a uh, dedicated teams to do research or design from there. And how I approach the localization topic can be dividend into several level. If you're designing for a commercial website, it's more likely that you consider the visuals and content. But if you're designing for products or functional websites, then you will need to look into the behaviors, users' requirements, and some of their mindsets which trigger their behaviors. Let's start with the website. Um, take Starbucks as an example for the visuals, like uh, international brands will sometimes have their standard website design, but you can see the copies on the UK versions and the Taiwanese versions, the language is different, the word in terms of difference, and the image can somehow fit into their, um, we'll say design thread and the user's preference as well. But sometimes take McDonald's as an example, um, they have two different design systems and you, will, you might have like uh, different functions like you can use the McDonald app, but in Taiwan you have um, web login area. So it can be various. But what we often do in agency is we will start to design the global or the headquarter versions. In our case, it will usually be the UK version first and do some desk research for, um, for the countries regards the design trade layout based on the reading experience. You might have some culture color scheme for the preference, font different graphics, and I would say you always need is professional translators um, because you might misunderstand the puns or use the outdated terms. And you will also need uh, key stakeholders as a like gatekeepers to review your designs not necessarily receiving feedback for your designs, but 
you can describe your goals and see if they can get the ideas. <clears throat> and moving to the contents, <clears throat> because all visual elements is actually come back to the content strategies. And one example is we did design for international insurance companies and their headquarters in London. So I had the opportunity to talk with their um, friends and Germany stakeholders. I asked questions to get some understanding regards the company DNAs and uh, for their clients and in different countries. Here's a question list. Interestingly, is the vocabulary, things that describe and the requirements can sound quite different. But when we try to decouple it and associate back to the company core values, it actually shows the same DNA. For instance, um, you can market some technical innovations and friends markets were looking for easy assets for their users. Um, the final design solutions might potentially be the same, but you will present and describe the functions and the brands in a different way to the clients. So I'll say you look into the slides, there's a cube as represent the company and the DNA is the uh, blue part. Inside it, each service is the way, the slightly different way you present the brand, the localized brand. <clears throat> And other example is <clears throat> similarly, they say people first in UK approachable in France and long-term relationship in Germany, but it all come back to the client first ideas. <clears throat> and when UK markets look for reliable, Germany is looking for consistencies and is actually the main idea is the commitments, a long-term commitments when you need to pay the insurance claims. <clears throat> so let's look the way we can apply our content strategies and localize the brand. You can iterate um, copywriting like slogans, include translations, um, use a different way to storytelling your brand and use familiar face in your image and video. So it feels more approachable. <clears throat> Next one is the, how about the digital products? My previous company, Huddle, is an online collaboration tools and our user is mainly in UK, US and some other countries as well. But you can image these features <laughs> as um, a to-do list for the users. So I do prototype testing and try to understand the patterns of how people prioritize their workloads. It sounds quite straightforward because consider like um, lots of different digital tools do the same functions, but strangely the resource come back 50-50. Like some people need a tight schedules associated with their calendars. Some people just need a list and checklist. Some people need their supervisor to tell them what to do next and others just want to have their own control. I try to like understand why this happens and find out this um, Hofstede's cultural dimension theories. There's six dimensions and I'm not going to the details today, but feel free to search online. And there's like lots of descriptions around it. Back to the hub, huddle um, task management, the reason becomes like power distance and collectives or individualisms. Like some people prefer their task system be private, but other people don't mind their team can see it or like touching their task and short term and long term orientation as well. <laughs> and I use the same theories to host the workshops in Aikino, try to understand how can we um, design for uh, different countries. We use FinTech as uh, examples. And the idea is like in the UK, they always promote like, let's start talk about money. Don't be shy, talk about it. And let's help teenagers or children to start saving earlier. But when we look into like East Asia, um, I take Taiwan as an example here. 
we start to talk about we want to invest invest in things because we already know how to save money and we want um, some extra functions that can save X amount of my salary because the expert told me that's the best way to uh, manage my incomes. So go back to the theories. We can see it comes from the power distance. It doesn't mean that we just want to obey orders, but it means we relied on some expert to tell you, tell us like what is a better way to do things. And in the UK, people just prefer to try things by their own. And it also comes to a certainty avoidance and short term or long term orientation as well. So the last last level, the bottom level, is the mindset and cultures and some reasons like building those of mindsets and how can we use on this size. I will say in short term, some reasons in short term may be adaptable. So that is the opportunity for designers to look into, which includes pop cultures, fashion trends, and trend behavior. It can be easily, not easily, but it might be able to change like quarterly or yearly. And technology and resource, legal, politic, um, that kind of reason, I'll just say, the world changed so frequently right now. So I would say it's changeable, but something is like deep in your mindset. <laughs> it's not easy to change. So you will need to, as a designer, you will need to try to align with your user. Is the uh, core value. So for instance, in the States, the core value will be freedoms and democracies. And in Taiwan, I would like to say food is our core value, but let's say family will be our core value there. And um, religions is also something is hard to change um, because it come from like very long history. Social norms and educations, it's a long term change. So I would say it requires at least three to four generations until things get changed. So it's probably not the best time for you to start think about it as a designers. Um, historical context is the facts that's already happened. So if it caused the, the cultures or it changed the mindsets, we can't really do anything about it. And in the end, I would like to say, as a designers, um, we try to learn and create things that works for our users and we hope they will like our designs but at the same time i would say you can and you should always challenge your things and be brave for designing for the better tomorrow if you know some topic is somehow against the culture you know um, for example like gender equities but you should always use uh, gentle ways and apply your empathies uh, last one. <laughs> Thank you for your listening. And you can always find me on the um, social medias. Apologize that my Facebook page is actually only written in uh, Chinese, but my Twitter is like mixing between English and Chinese. So feel free to like reach me over there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Shenzhen for your presentation and thank you for the to the ladies uh, of that UX uh, from uh, Taipei, so Jane and Evelyn, uh, for the time that you spent with us uh, and uh, for sharing your, your experience. Thank you so much. And now is the turn of the second chapter, ladies that UX chapter, uh, which is uh, quite well known, which is the mine <laughs> and my, me and Mariana. Um, so I'm very glad to introduce uh, um, Mariana Zaki. As, uh, who, who will uh, who will have her speech about uh, uh, UX and culture? Uh, Mariana Mariano Zaki, as she already um, presented herself at the beginning of this event, uh, she's a chapter leader of uh, this uh, this chapter Milan chapter uh, with me, and also she's also my friend and my colleague, and I'm more than happy to introduce uh, her speech. Uh, she's going to talk about the perception of UX designer expat. Uh, on culture and uh, and UX. So I pass the word to Mariana. 
Thank you, Ilaria. Let's see if my, my computer doesn't break. Um, okay, thank you for, for the presentation. I would like to, to talk about my, my perceptions and learnings as a UX designer expert. I hope my, my connection, my internet connection works and you can see me moving, not breathing. Um, so let me just um, set some things here. I will set a timer so I, I won't do more, speak more than I should. Um, so I would like to, to talk about my, my perceptions and learnings. Um, as a Brazilian Japanese coming to, to Italy to, to work. So, um, my name, wait, my name is Mariano Zaki. I work as a service and interaction designer Spindox, uh, a software comp consultancy company in Milan, also with Ilaria, by the way. And as I said, I'm Brazilian, but I, I have a Japanese heritage. Also, I'm one of the, the chapter leaders here of uh, Ladies at UX in Milan. Uh, sorry. And then uh, also, um, I, I'm the, the founder of this chapter. So when, I, when we decide to talk about UX and culture, the first thing that, I, I, that came to my mind was my, my own story and the story of my family that I would like to share with you guys today. Like it's not a thing that I usually share so much, but because we're talking about uh, culture, I I thought it was important. So my grandparents came from Japan in the 30s. Um, my grandpa, my Ojichan, he came here. He came to Brazil when he was a kid. So uh, my great grandparents, um, he was with his parents and his three siblings, uh, they traveled by, by ship all the way from, from Japan to Brazil uh, to, be, to have uh, new opportunities and to start a new life. Arriving there, they had no money, they couldn't speak the language, and they had only a piece of land that it was a promise by the, the government. Uh, by the way, there was a huge propaganda in Japan, so because of the crisis and in the in 198 no in the 29 uh, promising that people that people could go to to Brazil and have a piece of land and becoming rich that's what the the government was was promising to them uh, so that's what they what they did actually uh, not only me uh, but obviously many many Japanese families came all the way from from uh, Japan to Brazil and uh, now we are maybe three millions, if I, I don't, I didn't get wrong, of Japanese Brazilians living in, in, in Brazil. So this is my grandparents. And this in blue in the circle is my, is my dad. Uh, so even though I've never been to Japan, I know about the culture because of my family heritage and also about the like habits that we had at home. Um, some few words and this for me was very important growing up because I always noticed that uh, for me uh, it was important to understand different cultures and since a very young age to have more empathy and knowing that families would be different from mine like um, I spent some years uh, at school where my sister and I were the only uh, Asian people in the entire school, or I was the only Asian in the in the in my class. So, like, kind of seeing how uh, people could have different habits for me was very a uh, super interesting topic. So, in 2015, I it was my turn. So, I traveled from São Paulo to Milan to live. It was the first time that I I traveled abroad, actually. And it was a very important uh, decision for me because I, I haven't been in Italy before. It was my first time. Uh, I always knew that I wanted to live abroad. But at the same time, I didn't know anything about Milan. I, I knew that it was a, uh, a city, the city of fashion and design. 
um, but I had no idea. And then I I went to to travel by in my in the airplane, thinking, my God, I'm going to spend at least two years in the city, uh, like without having any idea what is going to happen. Uh, but it was very interesting because along with other uh, 100 students in my class from my masters from my masters in service design, I discovered um, more about different cultures and how it was fun to 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 know how people would react and how they would work and different projects and especially in the part of the communication. So I separated these three learnings that I'm going to pass very very briefly because unfortunately we don't have so much time and then i will share with you guys uh one case study wait i so starting from understanding the culture context so um Talking about culture, context is a very sub, sub, subjective uh, topic because like people have different cultures. It doesn't depend on the city, maybe in the, in the neighborhood you live in. Also, uh, many countries uh, speak different languages. So this part of the communication is very, is very important how to get to know uh, how to deal with people from, from different cultures. So um, people with high or, or low resources living in the same city, um, their perception and also the circumstances will change, of course. And when it comes to understanding the culture context, in fact, what we need to do is listen to what people are saying and understanding uh, their culture, their, their lives and their thoughts and their feelings. Uh, I see this applied also to to what we do as designers, especially in the part of the, the research, um, to be able to, to be in touch with different cultures and learning about the problem until we find a different solution. Not thinking about the biases, like uh, maybe this person this way, uh, they are going to use this way, not imagining, but uh, being, like, being sure, investigate, ask uh, a lot of questions so we can have a, whole idea of the situation. This is a very interesting book that I always use as an example when I speak. It's called, it's called The Culture Map because this is also a book that, that made me understand some things um, uh, about how to deal with certain situations. Um, and Ari Meyer says that when interacting with someone from another culture, try to watch more, listen more, and speak less. Um, one of my my struggles before and also um, right now, let's say currently, uh, it's like how to communicate and express my ideas, how to enter in conversations. Because coming from a Japanese background, we always wait for someone to finish their sentences and then it start to explain our own. But Italians don't do that. Like, and if you don't go right away and enter into the conversation, it seems like you are not interested or that you have, don't have anything to say. So these were, were some of the things that I, I, I've learned by, by doing. And also, please don't be this kind of person that they, you think that certain things are, are useful for some people, but actually they don't work for the final users. So the second learning was understanding how people communicate. Uh, when I say how people communicate, it's not just based on how to use grammar properly. Um, obviously, here I am Italy. I work with consultancy. I have to talk, uh, being able to communicate my ideas with my colleagues, my the developers that work with me, also my clients. And obviously, I do this in, in Italian. But um, obviously, changing, like switching your brain to, to another language, it's like you have to think differently. Also, not speaking about uh, different languages um, uh, in, this, in this sense, English or Italian or Portuguese. But for example, when we, when we have some solutions that in the end, if the developers were, are going to, 
to to do our concept we need to be clear and we need to be uh, in the same in the same page for them to to understand um and then yes um obviously uh in the beginning when i said it was a uh, i struggle when i came here because um uh, even though I studied uh, English since I was 11 years old, um, for me to listen to the conversation that people were, were having, like maybe a lot of the students uh, that studied with me during my master's, they, they uh, had the opportunity of doing an exchange. I didn't before. Um, so uh, being able to, to understand, receive the message and speaking, and sometimes this, this time, like this moment of waiting for my brain to process everything, usually it took a very long time. So in the end, I couldn't even speak, you know, this kind of thing. So like, but in the end, if you're communicating, trying to communicate is important for um, being sure that the, the, the other person is receiving the, the message. And the last learning is, uh, building a UX culture in, in your company. Uh, when I mean UX culture, I mean everything related to what we do. So being flexible, collaborative, uh, have empathy, and to adapt to continuous evolution. Like with our projects, we, we do it like this. Um, also, we work so much on understanding user needs and how they feel, their pain, their frustration and their satisfaction. So uh, bringing this culture to your team, it's very important. So like not dealing, like not leaving everything uh, like the best for for uh, the users, but also with the people that you, you work with. And I really believe that we're giving a heart to our product, product and creating experience will have a positive impact on people's lives and also to your team if you deal in the same way. Uh, so I would like also to, to talk about a project that I did in, in Brazil. This is actually was uh, my thesis project that was a, a very deep research um, that I did in the end of my course. That was a, a theme that I, I really, I'm really passionate about. So this project is called Maria Maria. So um, just for the, the context here, I hope I can do it uh, right away. So um, this was a project that I decided to do in Brazil because in the beginning I wanted to, to conclude it here. But the thing is um, that talking with other women, there, was not a, there wasn't a necessity of um, like danger in public transport. And in Brazil, it's the opposite. So I decided to do it there. Uh, so according to Action Aid, 86% 80, of Brazilian women have suffered of, uh, some form of harassment. And most part of them uh, in the public transport. Like these situations happen every day in, in Brazil. It's very, it's very common. Let's see. So, wait, so, um, wait, my slides. Okay, so because of fear, people, women don't, don't denounce the harassment because they are afraid that something can, uh, bad can happen against them. Um, so this become, this become um, a wicked problem. A wicked problem is a problem that is very difficult or almost impossible to solve because it's regarding to, to many different issues that by the system or by um, economics, culture. So um, these women, usually people in Brazil, they look for a more affordable means to travel. They, so they use more public transport because they cannot afford a private transport. Go. So they take longer routes to decide um, which is gonna be which is gonna be the best route to to go. If they have to choose between two routes, where one is faster, um, but the other one is 
um, it's longer, but with less danger, they will choose the longer one. And then they, in the end, they spend more time uh, in the public transport. Also, um, gender inequality lowers salaries, and this become like a more risk risk to to these women to be there in the public transport and like in the end being harassed. So I did a survey with 2,000, more than 2,000 answers where people were actually sharing a lot of details on, on, on what they, like what they, they are, they are experienced actually. Sorry. And then by the end of this, And then in the survey, 68% uh, of the Brazilian women uh, ha had told that they had already suffered uh, uh, harassment on public transport, but only seven had reported. And these are some of the findings that I, 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 I studied. So cultural behavior, there is a rape culture very strong in Brazil lack of awareness of what is a uh, uh, harassment or how to how to do uh, if something happens very difficult to report uh, if you I report the the complaint can be there in the police office and never um, nothing happens and then lack of staff training people don't know how to deal with the situation and then for the solution let's see uh, so then for the solution, my solution was this platform called Maria Maria, where you find report and awareness, uh, support community, um, community and education. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, if you guys have any, any questions, I had to talk very briefly about everything. If you have any questions, please let me know and add me on LinkedIn or send an email. Thanks. Thank you, Mari. Thank you, Mari, for your presentation, uh, your time, and for sharing with us uh, your experience, which is uh, quite unique. Um, thanks. So we have to move on to Thank the now. Thanks to our uh, next uh, ladies that UX chapter. The next one will be ladies that UX of Bangalore. So I'm very happy to introduce to you uh, Harsha and Manasi. Uh, that will introduce the Vina speech. So I'll pass the word to you guys. Thanks, Ilaria. You're welcome. Can we get the slides up, please? Now the slides are coming. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so I would uh, like to thank everyone for joining and uh, I'm very happy to be here along with my ladies that UX chapter uh, ladies gang uh, as we could collaborate with all the different uh, chapters and bring perspectives on different designing and culture in different regions uh, globally. So before introducing the next speaker, I would like to talk a little bit about ladies that UX Bangalore. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Can we switch the slide, please? Yeah, so uh, I'll start with the chapter leaders. Uh, myself and Veena, we started this chapter in 2015. And uh, uh, Mansi has joined us recently. So I'm Harsha Kutare. I work as principal UX designer with 247.ai in Bangalore. Veena is a design lead at Frog Design, and Mansi is experienced designer working with IBM. Uh, can we move on to the next, please? Yeah, so as I said that we are in our fifth year running, and we had like really great events so far. We have like a really great, uh, always growing community of 800 plus members today. Uh, 
we are uh, trying to aim at providing a platform where uh, we can talk, a lot of people can come together and network and talk on various topics. As you can see, it can be informal chats to workshops, to uh, research focused and things like that. Uh, so uh, can we move on to the next slide, please? Yeah, and we are on uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Uh, so please connect with us there and uh, looking forward to having more collaborations and events with people who have joined here. Yep, can we move on to the next? Yeah, so uh, with that, I would like to invite Reena, who, as I already said, is the one of the city leaders for Ladies That UX Bangalore, as well as she is the creative lead for Frog Design, and her topic will be designing for next billion users today. So off to you, Reena. Um, so as Harsha introduced um, me, uh, I'm a senior design lead at Frog Design. Um, and uh, so we I'm also one of the uh, city uh, uh, leads for uh, ladies at UX Bangalore as well. Um, so today, my topic uh, was really around talking about uh, designing for the next billion. And uh, my talk would primarily focus on, uh, on Indian users. Um, so when you uh, when you hear the word you know the next billion you must be wondering uh, who exactly are the next billion. Uh, so most of them uh, actually live in emerging economies and uh, they do not really belong to a particular age group, uh, but they are primarily using internet for the very first time. Um, and in the recent years, uh, you know, be, uh, because smartphones becoming more accessible to a larger population day by day. Uh, and it's also complemented by cheaper data plans. So internet has become more accessible uh, for this, uh, you know, for this larger demographic. And this is in contrast to uh, some of the developed countries where uh, users were typically used to uh, using internet uh, on the computers and then they moved to the mobile. So as UX designers, we, uh, we were more um, concerned about when especially when uh, when the switch happened for me in somewhere in about 10 years ago um you know i had to really factor in how do i um, you know uh, move from designing for such a wide screen to a, a really small screen but uh, for the for the next billion users they have actually started with uh, accessing internet for the very first time on the mobile uh, so their journey has been really, you know, using it for communication or for information or even for, um, you know, all, uh, any sort of online transaction um, on their phones. And, you know, the internet population in India is actually around uh, 620 million, which is, uh, and it has, it has been steadily rising. So in 2010, uh, it was somewhere in 100 million. So you can see that, you know, it has really risen, um, you know, it has go, it was risen by five times in just 10 years. And that means that there's a huge potential uh, for, uh, for many of these users uh, in terms of, um, you know, um, introducing them to online transaction or e-commerce. And, uh, you know, the e-commerce market in India is really projected to be around 84 billion in uh, 2021. And it also means uh, not just in terms of money, but it also means in terms of communication. Uh, so this year on New Year's Eve, there were 20 billion WhatsApp messages which were sent, and that was just from India. So that really shows the scale of, you know, why designers need to consider, uh, you know, the next billion users. Um, while I gave you all this rosy picture about, you know, what the, um, you know, what the scale of the market is and the opportunities we have, uh, but there are also numerous challenges, uh, especially for a country like India. It's pretty complex because India has many Indias within India, which means that, you know, there are uh, people, um, you know, there are numerous demographies within India. Uh, be it income. So as you can see here on this slide, um, you know, the in, uh, the earning uh, of Indians uh, really varies. 
so you have the top middle class uh, which kind of is comparable to um, you know the users in uk or uh, us or canada uh, so they earn pretty much on par with the middle class of uh, of the developed countries and you have uh, you also have the lower middle class um, you know you have the lower middle class segment uh, which is uh, which is comparable with you know some of the other developing countries so there's a huge income shift um, you know and that that kind of makes it a little harder to kind of uh, you know bucket bucket them in a certain group and added to this there are also numerous uh, languages in india so there are about 22 official languages and each language also have different dialects so which is um, you know which is which becomes very uh, difficult especially as there's no uh, single language which is widely spoken in in, in india although there is hindi but uh, but not many users speak hindi in south india neither uh, neither do indians speak or write english uh, it's very, it's limited uh, english is limited to a uh, to a very small group again and uh, you know english is not really understood or uh, you know users cannot read it in like in rural india and uh, you also have um, you know uh, mobile data in india is very very precious because most of the users here use prepaid connections uh, which means that you know smartphones and and uh, you know which means data becomes really valuable and smartphones as you know are not really smart without mobile data so you really have to be very conscious about you know what uh, what you're really uh, consuming or what users are really accessing uh, via the internet. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about, um, so when the designers uh, start designing for this uh, demograph, what are some of the key design principles we need to consider? Um, so mo most of, uh, you know, the next billion, they value convenience, which means that, you know, uh, they're looking for something which will improve their living standards. Uh, especially in the hyper-local context. Uh, they're also looking for uh, connecting emotionally. And as you, uh, as you saw in one of the previous slide, uh, that WhatsApp had like, uh, it's, it's WhatsApp is a very, very popular uh, app here in India. And the reason it is popular is because it also helps you, uh, it helps connect in lower networks. And uh, it, it also allows like a lot of informal conversations which means that you know primarily when you have to connect with your family or community at large um you know whatsapp is really uh, you know it's hit hit the nail right there and it has uh, helped build that emotional connect with the users and the third one is um, also giving them a feeling of instant gratification so the ability to get information especially in the current scenario um where you know a lot of information related to uh, COVID-19, um, you know, hotspots or containment areas, um, you know, which, and these are some of the information which can be, uh, which users can get instantly or, or at the touch of, uh, of the phone. Um, and that's really what really, uh, what they are really looking for. And the last one is uh, value for money. Um, as I previously mentioned that, uh, you know, mobile data is very, very limited. So users are really looking for uh, value for money um, in terms of you know making sure that they are downloading the right app and uh, you know they have they have all the information required to uh, you know to to get what they're looking for. And uh, let's also look a little bit on the cultural aspects, um, especially when we design um, uh, when we start designing for Indian users. So in India, most of the, um, you know, a majority of uh, Indians still live in uh, joint families, uh, which means they live with their grandparents or with their uncles and aunts uh, or cousins. Uh, so it's pretty common uh, to see uh, families like that, uh, which means that mobile is not a private device. It's, it's a shared device. Uh, so probably a device could be shared between uh, a uh, mother and daughter, or it could be shared between two cousins. Um, so, the, so basically, uh, you know, making sure that you keep that in mind that mobile is uh, you're designing for a shared device, 
um, is something you know which uh, which needs to be considered. So how do you create the sense of privacy in a shared device is really really vital. And recently, uh, Indians are connecting for the very first time uh, remotely, be it uh, online uh, education or uh, this, or just talking to their family and uh, community. Uh, you know, many Indians are doing it uh, for the very first time. Um, and and as I mentioned earlier, Indians really struggle with connectivity issues. So India does not have a uh, you know, great network, uh, which means that we'll have to design for power cuts, we'll have to design for low internet speed, and really all those disconnected moments. Uh, so one of the very interesting image you see on the left uh, corner of the screen is uh, recently I was reading a story of the student who couldn't access internet um, you know, within her room. So she had to climb on top of, uh, on the roof of her house uh, to be able to join an online class. Uh, so these are some of the scenarios, uh, you know, which we designers need to consider while designing for, uh, you know, for the next billion market, you know, that the, the device may not be used uh, in the comfort of the home, they might be, uh, they might have to uh, be outside uh, so that they can get a good connectivity. And uh, you know, with all the disturbance around them, uh, you know, considering uh, those kind of scenarios is something uh, you know you need to keep in mind. And uh, with uh, with the rising uh, cases of COVID nineteen in India, uh, many users are not really familiar with English. Uh, so so basically, they rely on the community uh, or on the family uh, to kind of get information for them. Uh, so one of the uh, most popular app uh, currently in India is Arogya Setu, uh, which is uh, which is a government uh, app designed for uh, getting information about uh, COVID-19. And although it's available in various Indian languages, um, but not many Indians can couldn't read or write. So they really help. Uh, they really rely on um, like the uh, like the village heads, which are called as panchayats in India or uh, their employers like for example if you work in a store then you would uh, you would rely on your on the store owner to give you some of that information um, on where you could get testing done or whether you have symptoms or uh, you know whether your area falls in the containment zone uh, so really uh, you know so uh, in uh, a lot of indians really rely on the community to get information so which means that you know you really have to design for um, you know for sh uh, not just shared devices but also for uh, something which is um, you know where basically where you're taking uh, information from other community members uh, and this is another example where um, you know uh, where Paytm they got this uh, Paytm sound box. Uh, because you know, again, uh, Paytm is basically uh, an online uh, payment app. Uh, like you go to a store and you know you scan this QR code, and you can uh, you know you can pay the store uh, owner uh, with uh, through the mobile. Uh, but again, you know the uh, the person sitting in the store may not have the same uh, may not have the phone with him at all times because the it could be uh, the store owner may have multiple stores. And, uh, you know, and that is tied to uh, the store owner, uh, you know, the phone might be with the store owner who is at probably at home or who is sitting in another store. Uh, so what Paytm did was they, uh, they came up with this idea of a box so that, you know, every time a transaction is done, uh, the, the cashier gets information that the payment has gone through. Uh, because earlier, uh, you know, as they did not own, uh, they were sharing the device. They did not get information if the transaction went through or not. Uh, so basically, you know, again, uh, you need to consider that you're designing for shared devices and uh, your device, uh, you're designing for, um, you know, something which is, uh, which is more community driven uh, rather than uh, which is private. And um, you know, also wanted to give you some tips on uh, what what it takes to uh, design some uh, you know um, you know design for the next billion market. Uh, 
Um, so, uh, so basically, you also need to share information, uh, like you're taking an advice from a friend. You need to skip a lot of technical details and be more human. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, this is a screenshot from uh, Flipkart, which is uh, a, a very popular online transaction tool. Um, so a lot when uh, when you're selling washing machines, uh, a lot of times you have information of the machine uh, in terms of the load capacity, whether it's uh, you know six kgs or uh, the capacity in terms of uh, uh, in terms of you know the weight it can bear. Uh, but they kind of moved away. They, uh, they realized that you know uh, users don't really understand the capacity in terms of uh, the weight. So what they did was they uh, they kind of started with understanding the family size. Do you have a family of four, or do you have a family of uh, are you uh, are you living in a joint family? And so it becomes more conversational. And uh, and basically, it kind of advises you like a friend. This here's the right washing machine if you have a family size of three or a family size of four. And uh, also, a lot of Indians, um, even though uh, they speak the local language, but there are also a lot of English words which have kind of um, you know seeped in through uh, you know in the local uh, in the local language. Uh, so uh, basically, so what that means is you need to design for English rather than Hindi, because um, you know when you translate to Hindi, it it might become more uh, literature based versus uh, versus the everyday spoken language. So for example, here uh, you know the arrow marks you see, um, you know basically they are using English words in uh, which is written in hindi so they are saying fashion or they are saying scan or they are saying offer and they are not really uh, translating those words into uh, into the local language so be, uh, so you need to understand you know that the, uh, you you have to there are certain areas where you need to use uh, english words like mask or you know uh, and leave it as it is uh, versus you know translating all the words to hindi and being as literal as possible um, makes it more convenient uh, because of the numerous demographies here in India. Images are preferred rather than icons. So, um, so we, again, I'm taking the example of Flipkart, uh, where earlier they had, uh, you know, they had icons for, uh, you know, various sections of their uh, of their portal, and then they. They switched it to images uh, because they realized that not everyone understood these icons, um, and again because of how uh, because of the various uh, states and various languages. So, I uh, being as literal as possible uh, made more sense, uh, you know, for them. And again, you can see this in uh, not just Flipkart but all the other popular apps in India, be it uh, especially when it comes to hyper local apps or. Um, you know, uh, or apps related to uh, providing information on COVID-19. Um, and also, uh, you know, making sure that you use a lot of celebrities to relay important information, uh, you know, kind of also helps uh, where, um, you know, where, where the message gets, uh, you know, spreads faster. Uh, so as you, uh, so this is uh, the image you see on the right side at the bottom. Uh, that's Amitabh Bachchan, who is one of uh, a very popular movie star, and uh, so they used uh, they uh, they asked him to provide me messages on you know personal hygiene and uh, wa washing your hands for 20 se uh, 20 minutes uh, 20 seconds, and so be, uh, so all this vital information on how to avoid uh, you know COVID nineteen uh, you know was done through Amitabh Bachchan. And uh, also, you you don't always rely on metadata or tags when you design. Uh, so this is a very interesting controversy which happened with Google. Uh, so basically, uh, and I'm sure a lot of Indians who are on this call would be very familiar with this. Uh, so um, so basically, when uh, when somebody searched for South Indian masala, uh, it showed images of uh, skimpily dressed women. Uh, versus when they typed North Indian masala, it actually showed uh, images of spices as they were. Um, so basically, what Google did was they just relied on uh, you know how uh, how the tags or metadata was in, in on a lot of uh, websites 
um and uh, they did not really do um, you know they did not really check um, you know these scenarios and uh, and it kind of really uh, it ended up promoting a lot of sexism or uh, regional bias um and uh, and it eventually uh, you know a lot of people started tweeting about it or talking about it and then uh, you know and then google had to relook at it and uh, basically now it's corrected uh, but you know uh, but what this really uh, a lesson to learn from this is that you don't really rely on you know the most popular searched or the most tagged um, you know tagged images or tagged uh, content but you really need to do a lot of uh, also do uh, you know um, rely on your intuition and also rely on uh, uh, a lot of data or testing data uh, you know to make sure that you have the design right and um, and also uh, most Asians they love uh, dis discounts so make sure that you reward uh, you reward the users for their loyalty uh, and uh, and uh, these are some examples from uh, the popular um, you know payment apps where uh, they re really reward you uh, as per your usage uh, and uh, and it's very very important that you recognize their loyalty and you reward uh, and you reward them and the last point is you design on the go. Uh, so basically, uh, you know, uh, as Indian, uh, as some of these users are using uh, internet for the very first time, so they may not really understand uh, a lot of basic interactions. Like, for example, is this a button, uh, or is this uh, is this where I touch to search something, or what does even search mean? Um, so some of these interactions might uh, is very very basic for them. Um, so what you really do is you you design, you release, you test, and then uh, you know you test if something is working, and based on the feedback, uh, you re you refine the design, and and basically you follow the same process again. Um, and yeah, and as I mentioned, because the demography is huge, and there are also scenarios where, uh, especially in the current uh, you know in the current COVID nineteen uh, situations where um, because this is something which has never happened before. Uh, and a lot of apps related to providing information on COVID-19 uh, is really uh, where, which has to be designed on the go or tested on the go. And, uh, and basically you tweak it instantly and, uh, and you change as it goes. Uh, yeah, so, I, uh, so the, uh, basically, um, you know, make sure that if you're designing for the next billion that uh, you're willing to experiment. You're willing to, uh, you know, you're willing to, um, um, you know, use some of your intuition. But at the, at the same time, you're willing to experiment, and uh, you know, you really release and you take feedback from the users, and and then refine uh, based on that. So thank you for attending my talk. You can also. Uh, follow me on Twitter, and uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, write in the comment box, or uh, you can also um, tweet to me, or you can also look me up on LinkedIn or Facebook, and, and uh, you can uh, you can also message me over there. Thank you so much, and uh, over to you, Mariana. Thank you, Vina. Thank you for your interesting speech and uh, for your tips. And thanks, uh, of course, to, to ladies that you ask uh, Bangalore chapters who join us today for your time. Now we have almost reached uh, uh, the time at the end of our presentation slot. And last but certainly not least, uh, I'm glad to present the ladies that you ask uh, Tokyo chapter. So a warm welcome to Mariko, who will introduce then Keiko's speech. OK, thank you for your time and participation. Please let me introduce our ladies that UX Tokyo. Ladies that Tokyo, uh, ladies that UX Tokyo started in November 2015 by Eriko Toda. The, she is also a CEO of uh, Happycom, IT uh, women's IT company. Today, sorry, she is on um, another appointment, so she couldn't join. But um, yes, Eriko Toda is a uh, uh, UX uh, ladies that UX Tokyo founder, also a happy com CEO, and I am a web con um, web uh, content strategist. 
and uh, UX, uh, we held a regular session and uh, we invite UX designers not only from Japan also, Canada, UK, and Taipei also. Uh, we study design tips, um, inviting various guests. And today's speaker, Keiko-san, already joined uh, Lady That UX uh, Tokyo as a speaker. Please let me introduce a little bit about Keiko-san. She is a former uh, Uber Japan's marketing manager and launched all of Uber Japan's products in the last six uh, and a half years and built markets with barrier marketing, PR, and community-driven initiatives. And she has a very curious person. She has a, she likes art and yoga and likes many, many things. So I will put you through to uh, Keiko-san. Please start. Thank you for your speech. Hello, everyone. Do you see my screen? Yeah, OK. Let me start my presentation. Thank you for your time. And then um, I would like to introduce myself first. And based on Mariana's recommendation, I describe myself. The, the black is a little bit brownish. Um, the long hair, the, the wavy hair, and then also I'm wearing the, the beige lace and that and then I'm base, basically I'm from Tokyo and I work in Tokyo, but um, I'm in Okinawa, which is like more close to Taiwan, I think Taipei, <laughs> as a research and also vacation at the same time. So thank you for uh, for this time. Even though with uh, you know different locations, we can connect like this. And my background is as Mariko san um, explained. Um, the background is a PR marketing in a business, but also I study um, design last year for one year. And then um, in Japan, it's, it's really interesting that the design art and then also um, the creativity and the business are huge topic because um, without it, you know, uh, all of the artificial intelligence is taking over all, most of the like, you know, uh, the work. And then now like we have to consider ourselves to be more man and also more emotional empathy and then create a great design and then also the business so let me introduce my uh, my work in uber um i work in uber at six point six years and then uh, um the last week was my um my last day in uber but i had a great experience so let me share with you right now and then i would like to introduce like two things the one is like introducing our Uber app and then how we can adapt the Uber app. It's a global app into different culture in, in Japanese culture. And the second is an example. So um, before talking about the more details of the, the product, let me introduce uh, what happened in Uber Japan. Uh, we launched Uber Black, which is a premium product in 2013. So I think uh, most of the countries, Uber is known for ride share, but which is, um, uh, illegal, um, it's, it's against the Japanese. So we launched a premium service in the first place. And then in 2015, we launched in a very creative way that it's like kind of like a grayish, like something like, you know, the white, um, the, the, the black in the middle, but the Japanese government doesn't like it. So we actually like um, the cross the business about one month um, later. And then we creatively think about how we can have this right share business into, into the coin, um, incons inconsistent with the Japanese uh, lo local uh, government system. And then we launched the two services in 2016, and which I will explain later. And then um, some of the countries might you know, have an Uber Eats system that you can request um, the food in an Uber app, and then we launched in 2017. And then taxi, uh, we launched in 2018. Uh, actually, Japan is the second largest taxi industry next to United States. So uh, which is really um, understandable for, for our business to adapt different culture, different like market dynamics into the system. 
So um, I would like to first of all summarize what it, what is impor important to local business in Japan. First is how our service or product solves the problem. Without it, it's just nothing for us. And then also the vision of the company, which is very important for Uber, um, the driver earn money, and then also they can go, they can uh, search for a different dreams. And then for riders, um, they have more freedom to go to uh, different cities. And then we be also believe our vision is how the drivers and riders interact and then um, move around the cities. Um, that will bring a more economic um, the growth. And now it's COVID-19 you know, period. Now you can see a lot of business suffering because people don't go out. So we would like to introduce um, this vision of the company to not only solve the problem, but also solve, solve the problem of the society, but also uh, bringing more happiness and more opportunities to the people in the city as well. And then um, I think I'll, most of us you know, are talking about community and communication, which is very important. Um, the next one is how our Uber app is a global app and then we share the same things together in a, in a, all of the cities and countries. Uber is now available 75 countries and uh, more than 10,000 cities around the world. And then we use the same app, but we, just, like, um, but we have a different translation, but, but functionality is completely same. However, we have a freedom to adapt a different kinds of vehicle system. For example, this um, left hand side one, which is like, um, sorry, it's in Japanese, but which is like um, the one hour, um, the reserve, reserved hire, which means that in COVID-19 area, uh, era, uh, people are uh, like taking a public transportation, but they have a high demand of going around the cities to go to hospitals, or do, doing some like grocery store shopping. So. So we introduced this new system to you book a hire for a one hour instead of um, ask, instead of requesting a ride every time to go to uh, different places, uh, which is like a big hit in Japan as well. And then the next one is a uh, Uber taxi. However, some people want to um, use a taxi service depending on different company names. So for example, if I really wanted to, you know, a taxi, but we have a lot of A, B, C, D, you know, different taxi in them. But this one introduces, you can also request, a, you know, for example, A taxi. So that means like, um, depends on the preference of the people, we have a more uh, freedom to give uh, the demand, uh, match with the demand. And then um, this is another, another example, how global app adapted to feature um, the Uber Eats and then Uber. Um, app, for example, in Uber, um, when we launch the service, only credit card was added. Um, however, we have a strong uh, demand from the local users that, especially for elderly people, they are afraid of using the credit cards, unfortunately. So we negotiated to the headquarters in Uber, and then we introduced Uber Cash. I think. I think in India um, and also um, Taiwan also uses the same system as well, but without you know introducing our local culture, we are not able to get this uh, new payment system. And then another example of, of the culture is like Uber Eats. Um, now, instead of like cash, they introduced a queue of system, for example, PayPay and Line Pay at the same time, because um, those are the very popular payment system in Japan and especially for Uber Eats, younger generation use it. So um, they have a more freedom to pay. That means that like, we have a more growth and more demand for the uh, for our business as well. And then I would like to explain about the example of Uber Japan and how to use utilize the global app in a local little bit of weight. Um, this is a very interesting example and how to request ride. So if you use um, in some of your you know, past experience, you just open the app and request a ride in your finger in the app, but that's it. However, some local residents, they cannot do it. And especially for the elderly people, um, because I share with you in the past, like we you know, try to do the ride share, um, the program, 
but that was uh, illegal in Japan. So we introduced to um, introduce a new system in co in cooperating with nonprofit organization in Japan that they provide uh, transportation services to uh, underserved area, the rural area for the elderly people. So when new age, you can't drive anymore. So our we um, partner with a nonprofit profit organization that they introduce our services to local residents and then we provide this app system. However, we discovered that those um, the elderly people don't have a app, don't have a smartphone and then even they don't really have a um, like iPad like this. So um, so that the problem was that you know even though they have a high demand of using app, However, they cannot use it. So we figured out how they communicate in a, in a local community. And we found out they go to grocery store, they go to hospitals, and they go to um, the cafes and restaurants. And then also there's a, a very uh, culturally interesting place that um, there is a public bus. It's like a public sauna. <laughs> they go to, you know, uh, regularly. So we negotiate with those places. And um, this is the picture of the grocery store manager. And then um, he, uh, on behalf of us, um, you know, work with the elderly people. So if elderly people wanted to take a ride with Uber, even though they cannot use it, but they call to the, this grocery store. And then this grocery manager requests a ride on behalf of the the, um, the elderly people. So this new ecosystem, a new ecosystem, which is very, very and very specific to this, you know, very particular <laughs> um, area um, really well. So we introduced this new system in a, um, one more area in Japan, um, which is like unique for, for Japan as well. And then the second example is uh, more like uh, how we communicate with uh, um, the customers. The, the, the left hand side, this is like a pilot program we we done, we're doing, uh, especially for the remote place with the elderly uh, riders. Like a very tr uh, trendy and then very cool looking Uber design. We introduced more um, elderly people picture and a big text. And then we ask um, the grocery store to introduce and then also put the poster of the uh, of the right so the people if they go to you know a shopping they can see this poster and then uh, they have a more chance to use our service and the second second example is uh, how we communicate uh, with uh, Uber taxi users based on Uber's global uh, brand guidelines. So top side is a uh, Uber Uber's global uh, brand guideline. But we have a more freedom to adapt into a different um, the culture. So, for example, uh, when we launch Uber Taxi in a city called Kochi, uh, we put the castle and then also a historical figure, which is very popular among people in Kochi. So they feel like a more little band to, to them. Like having like a global, you know, dancing people's um, design, and the second one is introducing um, the Uber taxi in a different place. However, um, we put a big um, the discount uh, figure, so they have a more um, tendency to use um, Uber. So, which is like very uh, uh, adapt to into a different culture. Um, my last example is how to make a magic in a product, product exchange. So when you reach a um, ride in an Uber app, always come into your way and then you can make a ride and then go to uh, you know point A to point B. That's it. However, uh, we have some experience of, of promoting this new um, app into a different way. So before um, making any um, business, we said one day, uh, if you open the Uber app, uh, you can uh, request ice cream on a very hot day. So um, we introduced um, this new um, the car go kart <laughs> to deliver the ice cream, and sometimes we do um, the the bicycle. 
to deliver the ice cream because in Tokyo, um, the road is so narrow and then parking a car is so difficult to do that. But, um, you know, but with the, uh, the bicycle, um, we have more freedom to deliver these um, things without any parking lot or any place to find places. And then um, we introduced a new band to experience how on demand means for them. Um, the one is like April for April 4th, um, the campaign that when you open up, uh, you can see a message that um, you can request a face mask and then drone actually delivers the, uh, your masks uh, from, from the um, from top. <laughs> uh, from the sky, uh, so which was very popular on um, the April Fool on the campaign. And second is um, you can actually um, ask Uber to gather your um, unused clothes, and then we gather those clothes, and then uh, we deliver those unused clothes to the non-profit government organization where. Um, People uh, who are affected uh, in a big earthquake and they are suffering for business and deliver those, you know, unused clothes, all the clothes to help them make uh, uh, slippers like this, to have a more entrepreneurship and a new business. Yeah, so this is my last slide. And then um, in a nutshell, I think make a magic in a product is always, always, always we need to focus on it. And then always bring a vision, the company's vision first in a product and experience and then communicate with the, um, the customers with hearts. So even like a tech world, but in the last end, I think how we put our heart and mind and then also the visions um, will be in, um, communicated in our design and our experience. So I think this is something I learned in Uber a lot. Yes, so that's, uh, yeah, that's my last slide. And thank you so much for, yeah, for your listening. And then if you have any interest in talking and have a more conversation with me, and then I put some of my um, the social media handles. Thank you. Thank you, Keiko. Thank you for your great speech, your experience, uh, and uh, also thanks to Ladies that you asked a chapter from Tokyo who participate and who join us today. So um, I just want to, to, to say something at the end of this presentation moment. Uh, I'd like to thank all the ladies uh, for, for your sharing, uh, for your inspiring presentations. And uh, I think re I really think we all learned a lot from uh, each one of you. And today, I think more than ever, we, we really need to to keep sharing, to keep confront ourselves uh, and sharing points of view, experiences uh, and perceptions about, uh, of course, design uh, and more in general about everything that uh, um, are passionate, uh, let's say that. Uh, but now uh, we can move on to our um, uh, panel moment. So uh, before leaving the scene to our public and to the questions that uh, will come with them, uh, I'd like myself uh, to ask you guys uh, uh, some some questions that I've prepared. So, are you ready for my questions? Yeah. <laughs> so, let's get started. Um, my first question uh, is this one. Uh, since you all have different design experiences, uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, what is the main challenge about design for a specific country reference market that is different uh, from your own? Um, I think the, the main challenge for me, at least from my experience, is being able to, to empathize with people that you don't know from a different culture than maybe um, some of these things like are already, I don't know, we already have assumptions of certain things in our head that it's not like because people are mean, but sometimes I have like uh, some like immediate reactions. Uh, maybe this person uh, understood everything that I said. Maybe I, I understood everything, 
also because uh, I didn't mention in my presentation, but um, Brazilian people, they, they speak in a very indirect way. We're not so direct. So um, getting to, to know how people communicate and understand what they, what they need, especially designing uh, new products um, here in Italy. Great, thanks, Mari. Thanks, Mari. And you, ladies, yeah. do you, what do you think? Yeah, I do agree with uh, Mariana that um, you know, empathizing with users is very important when you design um, for a different culture, uh, and especially it's uh, it's more uh, difficult in the current situation because uh, it's it's virtually impossible to do speed research uh, with the whole COVID scenario going on. And a lot of times you end up doing remote research uh, where you may not really, um, you know, it's not the same as being, uh, you know, being with the user in the same room and, um, you know, understanding, uh, you know, uh, you know, getting those, uh, you know, those, uh, feed, uh, those um, um, inputs or those feedback uh, which you would otherwise get being in the same room. Um, also, you know, like, for example, most of the Designers. We do design for global products or uh, for a different market. It's quite common. Uh, so, but I think in the current situation where uh, everything has to be done remotely um, is is a bit challenging. Although there are ways to um, you know to overcome that, but uh, but it's uh, but it's still a challenge. Thanks, Lina. Uh, I can go next. Um, yeah. For me, it is also the research part. Uh, I particularly think the interview process is quite challenging for me. And especially like when I interview people from different countries and quite often they assume I understand their part of thinking. And so if I don't understand this, like even I'm uh, interview like British here, I need to tell them in advance, like I I might need to ask like further questions just because I can't fully um, empathize on you. So just like bear with me. <laughs> and another way is like some, um, some users will feel they want to like hide some information that they don't want to share and you i i will also need to tell them like um i just want to learn from you i'm not judging your cultures or your country so please feel free to tell me whatever you think um i think to um break this kind of barrier is like quite important but as sometimes challenges just with like pure communications thanks thanks shinji keiko yeah so i Yes, yeah, and um, I think based on my experience in Uber Japan, um, I think the having a core product design and also have a local relevance, but at the same time we have a proof process. That's uh, a little bit challenging. Before Uber big, big uh, we have a more freedom, and then we just think about one week before, and then one week later we launch. We can do a lot of things, but nowadays like. We have a lot of a post system, <laughs> so that's uh, also a little bit um, the challenge I think for the local local experience. Yes, thanks. I can agree yeah, with that. With the ladies have the same uh, perspective. Perspective. Um, thanks. Here we go with the second questions. Ready? Okay. Um, in this last period, uh, we. All know that the culture topic is quite a, an hot topic uh, everywhere around the world. Uh, in this regard, in, in your opinion, can design play its part in favoring the cultural enrichment of individuals, preserving their uniqueness, uh, but at the same time highlighting the common traits? What do you think? I would say it's a great opportunity right now. And I think what design can do regards the culture is um, like promote the information and voice from different cultures and um, countries. And especially right now, so everything can be happens online and share 
globally. So that's the opportunity to do it. And I think designers should always um, consider like inclusive or equity as part of their um, design thinking and process. Thank you, Shinji. Wanna go next? If you have something to say, it's not mandatory. <laughs> yeah, I could go next. Uh, yes, uh, yes, design can uh, you know help enrich uh, either an individual or uh, you know even even their community and the culture at large. Uh, and as you saw a few examples in the slides I showed, uh, you know uh, basically. Um, you know, uh, with the use of, uh, you know, especially digital uh, medium, or when you design for the digital medium, uh, you know, you're helping, you know, being in, uh, you know, communicate with your community members better or help be in touch. Um, and, you know, so there are, uh, so basically, uh, you know, the designers are kind of enabling that. And uh, it is also helping them preserve uh, the culture or make their uh, make their spread awareness about their culture to the rest of the world. Uh, so in a way, we designers are uh, you know are enabling that whole process. Uh, so yes, I do feel that you know uh, design does play a, a big, huge role in enriching uh, the individual or preserving. Uh, you know their uniqueness, and at the same time, you know they can still preserve their own, uh, you know their own competence. That's true. Thank you, Vina. Thanks a lot. I I agree with some parts, but for example, from this moment that we are living now, I think it's very delicate. I think design can play, yes, for sure, a very important part on everything that is happening. But at the same time, I don't know about the the culture enrichment in the sense um, currently, um, because of all the situation that we, we've been through, like around the world, there are some certain countries that thanks to their culture they can like they can get rid of this situation like some like for example in taiwan they don't have more coronavirus anymore but like on the other side in brazil instead of them learning by by seeing other countries such as italy spain that we were close for uh, three months here instead of learning from this experience like they are doing the like I'm not saying everyone but uh, because also the the government they are open opening everything so everything's working right now so I, I'm not sure about the the cultural thing maybe it's culture maybe maybe it's not like but they they are not learning from other people's experiences Thank you, Maria. Mm -hmm. Keiko, you want to say something? And otherwise, I'm going to go to yeah. our. Okay, thank you. No. Mm -hmm. I don't like know. Uh, wish. Ah, okay. Mm. What? I can hear you. We create it like ah uh, with Uber. Yeah. Logo. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we use Uber logo. However, um, this uh, figure is a wishing. So this one is very popular among a lot of people, but we have a more freedom to you know adapt in a different way. So I, I think uh, the design um, gives out uh, people more inspiration and then uh, what we can do about having a core um, design um, the principle, but at the same time have a more freedom and inspiration. So I think, yeah, I think it agrees. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Yeah. Um, and my last, I promise my last question, and then we'll go open to the public. Okay. 
today we have the chance to hear many point of view and different uh, different thoughts and different experiences. So I want to take the chance and uh, I want to ask you this one. If you were to give an advice in terms of uh, design, uh, what are the golden rules, in your opinion, that every designer should always follow? That's a difficult I think, I think it's being open to criticism, being open to to feedback from, from your team or from other people that work with you. Uh, can be also clients or developers. I'm saying this because I work with consultancy and it's part of my, my world, let's say. Um, but yeah, I guess basically have empathy, being open and being always open to change and go also like go always for evolution on everything that you do and ask questions. I think it's very important to ask questions. That's a good one. <laughs> I'm gonna put, take a note actually. <laughs> what about you ladies? Can I go next? Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, from my side, I think uh, having empathy, being empathetic uh, and uh, empathy is one of the most important uh, aspect for designers. Uh, it's not just empathizing with the users you're designing for, but also empathizing with your colleagues or uh, you know the other team members, like you know, the, the entire team who is helping you build your design, like the developers. Also, empathizing with them uh, is very, very important because eventually, uh, you know, it's the entire team who's going to, uh, you know, who's going to build your design and uh, help it release to the market. Thank you, Vina. That's a good one too, actually. I think all of you have good, good talks, actually. <laughs> Thank you. Glad you. <laughs> yeah, um, I think that um, design is not about creating a cool thing, simple things. But uh, I think a lot of, I mean, all of already, but uh, have a purpose, and then also solving the problems, and then get, and then what's your goals? It's like creating a new business um, when we you know make a strategy for new products and services we always like you know have a step-by-step -step checklist so those are the things i think it's a golden rule and then that if those things are set you have a more freedom to think about how we can serve for the people and solve the problem yeah thank you keiko thanks a lot um, okay, um, I will say be um, be humble, be brave, and be creative. And that's especially advice for like um, young designers. And it's because we choose to do design and we believe we can change the world. But once you start working, reality is that you will face lots of restrictions. And so I would say you will keep learning and keep trying. Um, but at the same time, don't forget the mission you gave yourself that make the work better <laughs> or try to do something different. And uh, being creative is like in the end, you will find a um, different way or different concept to try to achieve your goals. Yeah. Thank you, Shenzhen. Uh, I think uh, we all have different, maybe we have different ways uh, to conduct and design uh, and conduct our methodologies. But in the end, uh, we can see that uh, uh, we go to for the same goal. And uh, maybe we arrive at it uh, in different ways, but in the end, it's the same uh, the same one for everyone. So it's uh, it's great to hear it. Uh, and it's great to see uh, four countries uh, uh, together um, in uh, this event. As uh, Legida Tuxtepe just wrote on the comments, Yes, it's quite amazing because we also have a time zone, different time zones, so that's quite amazing. Uh, thank you, ladies. Uh, this uh, first part of panel and for these first questions are done, and I really thank you for this. And now we can open the the, the question for the public. 
So I think uh, if someone has questions, uh, please write uh, on the, um, the write a comment on uh, YouTube or Facebook uh, or wherever you you are uh, to to contact with uh, with us. I know that we have uh, an an early questions that I just uh, traced, which is from I hope to pronounce it correctly, Xing Ying Lin. Hope it's correct. So please uh, forgive me if I, if I said it wrong. Um, so the comment was this one. Uh, I feel it's really changed. It's, uh, sorry, sorry, my English is so worse. Uh, I feel it's really challenging to conduct user research uh, under different cultural contexts. I wonder how do you overcome the language barrier while conducting user interviews? Usually they they ask for a translator to be part of the the interviews. So so this way the designers can be free, um, not depending on the language barrier. Um, so in this way they can communicate with each other and see like um, I don't know if they need to test the uh, prototype a certain prototype, or if they they have to understand deeply how the users uh, use um, the, the, their product or service. So I think it's very important to, to, to have this, this translator that will do this, this job. Also, before these interviews, um, usually there is a, a person that talks uh, about the culture of this, this place and how people deal with the things so I think this is very important to, to have in mind, to have a, a local person to tell you the story and then the designer will, will just get, get this information and, and listen um, because it's completely different. Maybe like coming from another country, we have an established idea uh, and a lot of assumptions of how it will be, or maybe we think we can think that users from my country can use um the, in the same way that users like in your country the users who, who have uh used the same way as mine so having this this local person to teach you how they do things it's very important too i think i will say if you got the opportunities and you can observe people's behavior by field research or shadowing and because you can actually learn a lot of context by just watching people and of course once you have any concerns or um, questions and then you ask the local person to describe what's why that happens for you and another way is like instead of doing um, fully conversational interview, you can try to use some design some engagement tools, maybe involve more picture. And so creating the more creative workshops so um, people can, mm, you can kind of like uh, bridge the um, language barrier. What about you ladies? Go and Vina. Yeah, um, I go. So I done an interview. Um, we we had a colleague who can't speak any Japanese, but in order for the interviewers to feel comfortable, we conduct the interview in a in a in a, a person's place, and then I present myself. I sit together so that the interviewees uh, feel more comfortable because Japanese people uh, present. My colleague, who is a main researcher, who is actually Indian, and then she can't communicate in Japanese, but we type, type in a chat and then she asked me a lot of questions. Please ask these questions to the people. And then I translate into Japanese and have a more personal, smiley, and a more like culturally relevant uh, communication, but my colleague also participate heavily um, involved in this, and then we conduct the research like that. 
Yeah, I think uh, in addition to uh, whatever uh, Mariana, Shunjay, and Kaiko mentioned, uh, because I think those are great points. In addition to that, uh, also just have a, a small uh, like a conversation before you start the interview. Uh, so, for example, you know when you go to somebody's house, uh, don't just uh, start by asking them questions. You know, make them feel comfortable because you're not speaking their language. Uh, and although you may have a translator with you, but uh, just uh, have a small talk, and you know if you see their if you see the cat, then you know have a small conversation about the cat, or you know, uh, you know, I mean, without really uh, going too private, but you know, just making them comfortable, uh, so that you know they, um, you know, they are they, they get used to you, uh, and not just the translator. Uh, so I think that is also uh, that really helps bridge that gap. I think uh, we answer the question. Hope. Hope so. So tell us if you if you're satisfied with our answers. Do we have a other question? If someone has question, please just uh, just ask because we'll, our speakers are here to to answer. So let's see. I don't think. So. We have some other questions for the moment. By the way, if you don't have a question now, uh, you can, of course, uh, contact us. Uh, the speakers uh, share their, their contacts, so you can, uh, you can reach them, uh, even if it's not now. So it's no problem at all. Um, there is a, a comment from Vanessa. That ah, she is the chapter lead from from São Paulo, and she was talking about the 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 case study that Vina presented, saying that here in Brazil the mobile the mobile is particularly almost a private document, like we don't share. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, when you say share, it's typically between. Uh, most of the scenarios it's uh, between family members like uh, because not everyone in the household has a smartphone maybe uh, maybe father has a has a feature phone but you have a smartphone uh, so if you have to book uber then you know the father would rely uh, on another family member who would do that for them um, you know that could be one scenario but it also depends uh, like you know the lower income groups they might be only one for phone per household um so there that's where you know that's where you end up sharing the phone uh, and because indians also live uh, tend to live uh, you know with their parents or uh, with other uh, like your uncles or other uh, family members so it's it's a very common scenario uh, and it also depends on your income level. Uh, like if you're, if you fall in the high income group, then probably everybody in the house has a phone. But if you fall uh, more in the lower or, uh, you know, somewhere in the middle range, then probably, uh, you know, not everyone in the household has a phone. Uh, so that's where you know you end up. Uh, yes, I do agree. It's it's very different from the West, where your phone is very private. Uh, but in India. Phones are shared. Interesting. Um, let me see. There are some people that are asking if um, they can watch later. Yes, we we always forget to say this in the beginning of the the presentation, uh, in the beginning of the event. Sorry, uh, but actually this is going to be recorded in our YouTube and Facebook channel. This is the first time that are going, we're doing the, the live on Facebook, so it's going to be recorded for everyone to see it again. Let me see if there is. Yeah, many no questions. Many compliments for you. Yes, many, many compliments. Um, also, Cecilia from La Paz, Bolivia. She was watching us. Hello, ladies. Uh, La Paz. Also, 
Vanessa, as she commented before. We have a question. Yes. So, have you guys ever had a chance to apply the knowledge methods of UX and UI to manage project progress in project manager's perspective? From Wang Ivan. Evan. Um, yeah, I could probably uh, answer this question. Uh, so basically, yes, uh, 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 you know, one is you can also work very closely with the project manager to kind of uh, see the progress of your design deliverables. Uh, the second thing is there are also a lot of tools uh, which you can keep track. Um, you know, this especially like if you use tools like Jira or uh, uh, you know, Jira or uh, a lot of these Atlassian tools. Uh, it helps you keep track of your uh, of the the progress of the project. Uh, but typically, I work very closely with the project manager uh, to kind of track the progress of the project. And again, since these two tools can be shared uh, with the team members, uh, so I think uh, it's important to choose one of these tools, and uh, you know, which will help you track the progress of the project. Uh, I hope Huang, I answered your question. Uh, and if others have anything else to say. I think you can also answer this question, Ilaria. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I actually agree with Divina. Um, yeah, uh, an important thing, I think, to, um, to keep in mind uh, with the project progress, uh, if it's a design, a design project, of course, uh, it's the the task, it's the task and the the teamwork, and how to uh, get people assigned and get people involved in the, in the whole project, in my opinion, and uh, let them aware to be aware anytime and any moment uh, of what is the goal of the task, what is the time. So this kind of uh, very maybe make very precise things and details that really makes the difference in the end so um this is this is my opinion about uh, the project progress uh, in, uh, with a, a manager perspective i'm not a manager i want to, <laughs> to underline it but uh um i will i will i work with uh, with managers so i uh, i just can say this 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 be this part we can share with you. Um, my experience is like working UX team working closely with the product or project managers, and how we provide our UX knowledge is like um, when uh, digital products want to release in different versions, um, like we say MVP or beta beta versions. Then we will help the product managers to identify like. What is the user's learning curve and how can we dividend the features into different phases? Or when we want to renew the design systems and what is the sequence um, when we want to release like one by ones and that can help them to uh, figure out the long-term roadmap. Hope we answer to your question, Wang uh, Evan. I hope you pronounce it well. Pronunciation today is my issue. <laughs> okay. There's also a nice comment here for for Keiko. Thanks, Keiko. Great to see how a global company hyper localized their their app for better user experience. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So I think if we don't have any more questions, I I would like to to say uh, wait. There's one more. Okay, there's one more question. So. Um, how has post lockdown user experiences have changed according to you? 
what do you think upcoming UX designers should be know? Ah, that's a good one. A kind of a uh, kind of tricky one. Who want to go first? Very polemic, I guess. <laughs> Uh, I think, in my opinion, is like first of all, the when we try to do user testing, it might become more remote. I mean, we are forced to do remote user testing, and the design tools will be more like online and collaborative. And another thing is like I see, especially for tech industry, previously is quite number KPI or financial driven. But right now, people try to apply more empathies into like whatever message you want to deliver to the users. And I think that's a positive change, though. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. Um, I think now one of the, the challenges is like in certain way, like losing the, the physical contact with people. So testing, understanding that it doesn't really replace uh, online tools that we use now um, because we don't have like the feeling of looking at someone, like seeing the body language and understanding what they are doing. Also for, for the, the part of the um, interviews, the research, uh, shadowing, um, that we don't have this physical feeling about people. Um, but I think at the same time, on my point of view, I, I guess people are more vulnerable in a certain way, like, um, because before, I guess people try to, to look um, like perfect, let's say. And now that we're doing everything online, sometimes there is a, a dog barking on the background or a baby crying like usually we do meetings where there are many noises or the moms speaking on the phone like this this happens a lot in our in our team in the team that i i work but it's okay you know because sometimes uh, i think before people were um trying to show not to show this this side you know like avoiding um showing people that we are humans that we we have flaws, that there are other things happening at the same time, that we're working from home. So I think it makes more more human for us, not only for us, but we, we the people from our team, um, our clients as well. Like yesterday I had a, a call with a client and the baby was crying in the background, you know, and he was like trying to avoid like embarrassed. But I think I think that's that's nice to see this kind of side of people instead of just maintaining like um, appearance that we are invincible and super powerful, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I do agree uh, with uh, what, uh, what Shinji and Mariano mentioned. And uh, apart from research or testing, it's also uh, you know like brainstorming together. So when you're in the same room, uh, you know, um, when you have to brainstorm uh, about design, it, it's very, very easy. Like, you know, you uh, you argue and uh, you have, uh, you literally draw or you use post-its and you, uh, you brainstorm and then you come to a certain decision. Um, I mean, even though there are a lot of online tools like Miro or, um, you know, there are a lot of tools to, to kind of do it online, but it's still, um, you know, but the experience is very different uh, being in the same room versus doing it virtually. Um, but of course, you know, when you're virtual, uh, it's a bit, it gets a bit more organized because uh, you're using virtual tools and, uh, you know, you have to use it in a certain way. So, uh, so it helps it be more organized. But at the end, and everybody gets a voice because there's sometimes when you brainstorm, there are some quiet folks in the room versus. Um, you know, people who are more vocal. Uh, so when you are virtual, everybody gets uh, opportunity to kind of, uh, you know, uh, showcase their ideas. But uh, but the experience is very different, um, you know, when you are in the same room versus when you do it offline. So I think uh, 
for the upcoming designers yes being very familiar with uh, you know being familiar with the online tools uh, 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 and having them as part of your design process is very very vital because i think at least for the next 6 months uh, we will still be working virtually most of us uh, so i think just being accustomed to uh, you know these virtual tools will be very very important Um, I would like to add one more thing that the Uber rides business, um, like especially like the ride share business, um, suffered 80% lost uh, because of the COVID-19. So we only like earned 20% of what we um, what we earned in the past. So I think nowadays um, the people's behavior is completely changed because of COVID-19. Our business changed. So. Um, Yeah, in in terms of how we provide service business is very important to listen to customers' voice, listens to customers' um, you know concerns and then what they are afraid that what they feel more comfortable, acceptable, and then we need to change our the service or product completely, one hundred eighty percent completely change and um, depends on how we serve for the customer better way. So. That's something that we learn in a COVID. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we don't have any more questions. So I would like to thank all of the chapter leads that are behind. Like, of course, we're going to show all of you. Uh, we take a picture together with our, with all the chapter leaders. uh that helped us organize this initiative this event that for us is very nice to collaborate with other chapters that before we didn't have this um we didn't have this opportunity so i would like to thank to to jane to vina harsha manasi um evelyn um mariko erico uh obviously ilaria <laughs> that she she's doing this with me um so i would like to thank all of you all the speakers that joined us today to share your your experience and your case studies that for us is very valuable so i would like to take a, a screenshot with the with the chapter leads um let's see I don't think I can put everyone in the same. How can I? We take one screenshot now. <laughs> And then we take another one with other people. Wonderful job, Laria, Mariana. We really enjoyed the talk and then the panel too. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Mariana, thanks for all the technical, you know, <laughs> all the back and setting up the video and yeah, the live stream. Thank, you. Thank you very much. I enjoyed and I learned a lot. Thank you, ladies. It was a pleasure to have this uh, event uh, with all of you. I really couldn't believe it when we started <laughs> talking about it. But it had a lot of behind what we said. A lot of yes. work. So, applause to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, also, let's take a screenshot of the speakers. Yes. Sorry. Okay. I my image is always frozen.
like okay <laughs> i would be like look terrible in the picture but it's okay as long as you you guys look nice so that's it i i will call again um Ilaria and also Jane. Jane, she yep. covered her camera. And Mariko. So I I would like to, to thank all of you for the organization and for this amazing event. I really hope we can have more events online that we can do it online and then i hope we can finally meet in person <laughs> yeah. i hope yeah so everyone's so healthy yeah. <laughs> yes. so, breaks. <laughs> so that's it i'm that's it i i i would like to thank you very much and uh, if you guys didn't, um, uh, please give a, a like, a thumbs up in our in our video on YouTube. Okay. And let's keep in touch. Um, then we talk. Okay. Uh, for the ladies that UX then, that are following us from YouTube, uh, please follow all these chapters that presented the the the. Uh, they, they, they did the presentations today and see you for the next events. Keep, let's keep in touch. Yes. Be safe and be healthy. Okay. Yes. Okay. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.